welcome to the Speaking of Women's Health podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Holly Thacker, and I am glad to be back in the Sunflower House in this cold February 2024. And it's February, the month of love of hearts of Valentine's, also Red Dress Day. And it's important to talk about matters of the heart, heart disease, cardiovascular disease in women, how women are different than men, and why every woman, regardless of your age or your medical status, needs to know about heart disease. It is the number one killer of women in the United States and men. And we've had increasing incidence of heart disease, heart failure, uh, sudden cardiac death, uh, myocarditis, dissections, aneurysms. There's lots of different things that can go wrong. Valvular heart disease for rheumatic heart disease. So we're going to go over things that you should know. Tips to prevent yourself from getting heart disease. How to further assess whether you need interventions or treatments. What you can do to be proactive. What some of these medical terms mean. Of course, we will always focus on lifestyle. And I really want to bring up the gender differences in heart disease. Uh, And I want to talk about what to do if you have chest pain. And why love handles are bad for your heart. And this is going to be really a jam-packed podcast here in the Sunflower House. Uh, When I was starting my career at the Cleveland Clinic, I actually came to the Cleveland Clinic because I didn't want to have to move my husband more than once for residency and fellowship. And I always assumed I was going to be a cardiologist. So, of course, even back then, it was the number one institution for heart disease in the United States. And so I was coming to do my internal medicine training, and then I was planning to follow it with a fellowship in cardiology. In fact, my first publication when I was a junior staff uh, at the Cleveland Clinic was in the prestigious New England Journal of Medicine, and it was a letter to the editor where I blasted them (laughs) and the American Heart Association for not being gender specific. Well, that was quite a while ago, and finally, on their last iteration of the American Heart Association, they did come up with more gender-specific information. And I was fascinated about the differences in presentation in women. Women don't have typical angina pectoris uh, like many men have. Many women don't have any hardening of the arteries, but they have small microvascular spasms of their arteries from lack of estrogen. Um, women tend to present a little bit later. They tend to have more hypertension and stroke. Diabetes is generally a worse risk factor for heart disease than men, even though both are um, not, not good things to have for your cardiovascular system. And so the uh, late, great Dr. Fred Loop, who was our CEO, that caught his attention. And um, that was before people were sending emails. That's how long ago it was. He had his secretary type me out on one of those old-fashioned typewriters uh, saying, you know, brava, go after them. And I didn't end up doing a cardiology fellowship uh, because my senior year, I did some rotations in the menopause center Uh, with my mentor, who still I communicate with regularly, Dr. Del Boer, who is now retired. And uh, he did training, uh, advanced training in gynecology and hormones and reproductive endocrinology and did a lot of urogynecology and focused really on the 50-plus-year-old woman. And uh, very comprehensive, would get cholesterol levels, would counsel women, check their bone densities for osteoporosis. And I rotated in his clinic. And I would see women who were just otherwise at the peak of their life and they seemed like wilted flowers, having hot flashes, poor sleep, cholesterol shooting up, blood pressure going up, weight 
coming around the belly, just everything kind of falling apart right at the time of their life that they have raised their children, they've hit their stride, either in their community, their family, their career, etc. And then things kind of fell apart with the lack of estrogen. And so many diseases seem to get worse with lack of estrogen or at the time of menopause. And I looked in the internal medicine textbook, Harrison's textbook of internal medicine, which is about this thick. And there was one little paragraph about menopause. And it just seemed so wrong. And when I would do my rotations in cardiology, I would see women who looked like they had classical hardening of the arteries, but then when they went for cardiac cath, it would be normal. But they still had their chest pain and shortness of breath and fatigue, maybe even pain going down their arm. Um, and what they had was microvascular disease, not, not disease of arteries that you could see on just a standard cardiac catheterization. And so there was hormonal links to this. And I just decided that there really uh, was not enough expertise bringing internal medicine and cardiology and gynecology and bone health and hormones and prevention with a, a attention towards prevention and functional medicine. So I set out to do my own self-training and then people came. It's like, if you build it, they will come. Um... I had a uh, male uh, internal medicine resident who had previously been a veterinarian and he was going out into practice and he was in his 40s. So he knew that uh, he was more mature maybe than the average uh, resident finishing up, that he would need to know a lot about midlife women's health. And he had heard about me and how um, I worked with medical breast and endocrinology and radiology and gynecology. And so he came from Texas to rotate with me. And I still keep in contact uh, with Dr. Jack Ward. And um, he just loved the rotation. They brought me down um, to talk to the head of education, Dr. Andy Fishleader, who later became our first dean, and said, you have to start a fellowship. Uh, this is just so important to do this interdisciplinary women's health. And it really started with my interest in cardiology and women's hearts. So we are going to dive into this podcast to talk about the tips for protecting women from heart disease. A lot of this information is on our Cleveland Clinic, um, our specialized women's health center, and our nonprofit, speakingofwomenshealth.com. And we have published columns um, for the last 16 plus years. And I'm taking some information that I previously wrote and updated on the five health tips for protecting women from heart disease. So pop quiz, ladies, what's the number one killer of women? Breast cancer, ovarian cancer, stroke? I already... We'll be back after a quick break. Have you ever experienced fitness failure? You know, you set a, a goal to exercise, you're all excited, and then you're not. Hi, I'm Dave. I host the daily 10-minute podcast, Walking is Fitness. Instead of an exercise goal, I talk about making a fitness promise. And every day you keep that promise, you add another link to a growing fitness chain. This is a podcast of action. You'll create a fitness habit, which eventually becomes fitness momentum, and then on to all kinds of good stuff. Check it out. Walking is fitness, and let's take a daily 10-minute walk together. told you the answer at the beginning of this podcast. It's heart disease. And it's previously been commonly viewed as a man's disease. And heart disease does cause at least uh, a quarter of all of women's deaths each year. And age is a risk factor. And after menopause, your risk does increase dramatically because the heart becomes more vulnerable when your ovaries stop making estrogen particularly if you have other risk factors like type 2 sugar diabetes or type 1 diabetes, cigarette smoking or any kind of nicotine use, weight gain, hypertension. I would like to say that estrogen is kind of the keeper of our hearts. It does a lot of good for your cardiovascular system. Uh, oral estrogen is associated with lower LDL bad cholesterol, lower LP little a, which is a genetic risk factor. That's separate from your regular lipid panel. Uh, oral estrogen increases HDL, the high-density so-called good cholesterol. 
It promotes nitric oxide, which can dilate blood vessels and help protect the endothelium from blood vessel injury. Your endothelium, the lining uh, inside your arteries and veins, is a huge organ that is very metabolically active. Uh, it can help prevent plaque from building up in arteries, although if you already have hardening of the arteries and plaque, uh, estrogen will not be helpful. So you really need normal arteries to start with. It does seem to aid in the formation of new blood vessels. And evidence shows that estrogen may pay, play an important protective role in younger women because premenopausal women rarely develop coronary artery disease. It's very rare. Certainly those with diabetes and smoking, um, you will see some premenopausal cases or people with very strong family histories that have inherited uh, problems. So the question uh, is raised, will menopausal hormone therapy help the heart? And as you know, from season one, we talked lots about hormone therapy, menopausal hormone therapy, bioidentical hormone therapy. I podcasted my book, The Cleveland Clinic Guide to Menopause. You can go back and listen to select chapters uh, if you need to review. Uh, but we have known for some time, uh, just based on large observational data, that women who take hormones within a decade of menopause uh, and take them for a while have much less cardiovascular disease, less burden of many diseases. But the Women's Health Initiative, which I've also covered in detail, it was uh, published July of 2002, and it really shook the medical world, and it dominated the news, uh, the media, the internet, on women's hormonal health. And it really cast... Uh, the research results in kind of a negative and limiting way. Um, and the government, which funded uh, the study, the NIH, well, we the taxpayers did, it was the largest preventive trial done, very expensive, was put together primarily um, by the heart and lung and blood uh, sections of the NIH um, without really GYN women's health input quite as much. And because it was a randomized controlled uh double-blind study where the patients and the physicians didn't know who was on what. They picked women that were well past met the, the age of menopause, a good 10 years, so they didn't have hot flashes. Because if you had hot flashes and you took a placebo, maybe you might get a little better from the placebo effect. But if you took hormone therapy, you'd have sustained effects on um, reducing hot flashes. So they picked an older group of women. And unfortunately, uh, many American women by the age of 63, especially if they're overweight and have maybe smoked in the past and uh, a good percent have diabetes, uh, most of those will already have subclinical heart disease. And so it's very important whether you're talking about completely normal arteries or arteries that are starting to get diseased. And so based on uh, the reports from the WHI, uh, the United States Preventive Health Health Task Force discouraged the use of hormone therapy for heart protection. And the American Heart Association kind of initially agreed, but they have come around to realizing that lack of estrogen is a risk for heart disease. And in certain circumstances, um, menopausal hormone therapy can be beneficial. But because hormones are therapy and they can cause bleeding and oral hormones can rarely cause blood clot, if you're doing something solely for prevention, you can really have no harms. So when we talk about some of the preventive effects on hormone therapy, we're usually talking about it in a group of women that have other reasons to take hormone therapy. And this is just kind of like the cherry on the top. There was a result of a, a very important long-term study out of Denmark, um, and it started to raise questions um, about just accepting the dogma of the WHI, which I think promoted a lot of fear. And we've certainly seen that um, going through the pandemic, the panic that was induced, um, the kind of exaggeration of some of the details, uh, and a lot of fear mongering, um, which kept people cloistered, patients who needed medical care, even uh, my the chief of uh, our, our fire department just lives down the street from me, and he was telling me how during the pandemic, it was terrible. There'd be people having heart attacks and strokes. And, you know, when you have a heart attack or a brain attack, you have to call 911. 
Uh, time is of the essence. Getting that blood vessel open to save the heart muscle or brain tissue is, is premium. And patients were so petrified from what they were seeing on television that they wouldn't even go into the hospital. Um, so it's very important to not be manipulated by fear. So this long-term study from Denmark that followed women ages 45 to 58, which is more of the range of time that we would generally start hormone therapy. There are exceptions, but um, not people over 63 to 65, um, which was more typical of the Women's Health Initiative. They looked at a large group that received hormone therapy and a large group that didn't. And over 10 years, the ones that took the oral hormone therapy had really positive results, like half the death rate compared to women not on hormones, less heart attacks, less heart failure. And the really big news is they had no increased risk of cancer, stroke, or blood clot, even though it was oral hormones. Now, for women with a history of blood clots or at risk for blood clots, we tend to favor the transdermal hormones because uh, putting on estrogen the skin by patch or gel or spray does not go through the stomach or liver and does not increase blood clots. And I did a nice podcast on uh, women in menopause and blood clots with one of our graduates, Dr. Tiffany Cochran in season one. We'll be back after a quick break. Are you ready to unlock your full potential? I want to introduce you to the Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast, a powerful resource to transform your life today. With expert interviews, practical tips, and inspiring stories, this podcast is your roadmap to lasting wellness. Here's what a listener has to say. I used to struggle with my health, but this podcast changed everything. It's like having a personal trainer, nutritionist, and life coach totally for free. With over 2,000 five-star reviews we're a podcast you can trust the fit healthy and happy podcast available now wherever you get your podcasts so instead of just giving hormones the least amount for the shortest period of time which is completely um you know out the window and kind of an urban myth that you don't need to use the lowest dose for the shortest period of time as if it's a poison no we do use an appropriate dose, a dose that's going to reduce symptoms or side effects. But we're not just using it for symptoms in many women. We're also using it for the preventive benefits. Hormone therapy reduces diabetes, reduces cardiovascular disease. In most women, it doesn't raise blood pressure. Rarely with oral um, hormone therapy, that's menopausal. And I'm not talking about hormonal contraceptive doses, which certainly can increase the blood pressure. Most women don't raise their blood pressure. In fact, in women on hormones being taken off hormone therapy, many of them will actually increase the blood pressure. So in terms of getting back to some tips for a heart healthy lifestyle, um, we'll continue to look at the role of menopausal hormone therapy. Uh, there's, it's, it's complicated and if you have existing heart disease, I think it's important to seek out uh, experts that understand this. Uh, and there are lots of ways that really are not controversial to reduce your risk of heart disease. And they probably sound familiar to you because they apply to all of us, uh, any any sex, any age. Number one, don't smoke. Cigarette smokers, not only do you age faster and it's bad on your skin and it makes you smell and it's expensive, but smokers have more than twice the risk of heart attacks compared to non-smokers. Every one to two cigarettes a day greatly increase the risk of heart attack, stroke, and other cardiovascular conditions. And it's not good to be exposed to secondary smoke. Number two, treat medical conditions. If you have diabetes or high cholesterol or high blood pressure, you're definitely at increased risk. If you have all of them and an apple shape with your waist not being at least only 80% of the size of your hips, like the apple shape as opposed to the pear shape, you might have metabolic syndrome or syndrome X, which is even worse in women. If you have fatty liver, uh, that's a tip off that things are not metabolically right. So maintaining a healthy body weight is kind of like the holy grail and focus of almost all midlife women and beyond. And the more you weigh, the harder your heart has to work, the faster your heartbeat is. Um, and it's bad on your joints and then your joints don't feel as good so you're not as active and it's kind of a vicious cycle. Number four, exercise throughout the week. Um, you do need regular workouts of that heart muscle 
and we like moderate exercise for at least 30 minutes a day on most days and high intensity interval training can be done we do like a certain amount of weightlifting after age 45 to help build the muscles up and help the metabolism we want women to stretch before and after uh, one size does not fit all there's lots of different types of exercise there's some data that being in really hot temperatures like a sauna causes vasodilation and increased pumping of the heart and kind of gives you a little bit of exercise without uh, breaking that sweat on the treadmill yourself. Um, I really like to go on an elliptical and I do that most every morning, gets the blood going and it's kind of easier on my knees and hips. Number five, a heart healthy diet, Mediterranean, uh, colorful diets, uh, try to avoid uh, anything processed, no trans fats, seed oils and sugars are big no-nos. Refined sugar, think of it as poison. You want heart healthy fats like omega-3 and that can come from like tuna or salmon or sardines or other fish. Uh, flaxseed or almonds or walnuts are good sources for those that don't like fish. And generally we like the mono unsaturated fats, particularly olive oil. So when you hit midlife you need to start to plan for your second adulthood and um, certainly menopause and lower estrogen levels can be dealt with and, and shouldn't uh, get in the way of you living a full vital life and the central aspect of all of this is your powerhouse your heart and so as a woman's health specialist I really want my uh, patients to feel like they can get reliable information and the best health care and don't be afraid to ask questions. And if a doctor says, oh no, menopausal hormones are bad for the heart, and they just totally summarily dismiss you, then you can realize that they're probably stuck back in the early 2000s. And we're in 2024, uh, people. So it might be time to see someone else. So the next section I'm going to go over, and you have been listening to... The Speaking of Women's Health podcast. I'm in the Sunflower House. I'm your host, Dr. Holly Thacker, the uh, Executive uh, Director of National Speaking of Women's Health. And we are talking all things heart. And how heart disease is different for, for women is what we're going to shift to. Biologically, women's hearts are different than men's hearts. They're different in terms of how they respond to medicine, uh, diagnostic tests, and differential responses to um, as things that we medically uh, do, as well as uh, agents that we use like statins. Cholesterol-lowering medicines have been uh, a big breakthrough, particularly for those with uh, problems with very high LDL cholesterol, uh, those that have hardening of the arteries or have had heart disease or heart disease equivalents. And certainly secondary prevention has been shown for both men and women with statins, but not primary prevention for women. And too many times I see women who don't have existing heart disease, who just have risk, treated as if they're a male based on the data. And statins can increase the risk of diabetes. And diabetes, as I mentioned earlier, is actually worse in women for a risk for heart disease than it is in men. So you don't want to prevent something but for a problem you don't yet have and then cause another problem. Uh, so it's very important to get individualized care. Not just the presentation of symptoms like angina or chest pain, but also electrical conditions of the heart uh, can, can be different in women. And women are much more likely to develop a prolonged QT interval, torsade de point. And uh, medications like Seldane, which have been pulled off the market because of this fatal arrhythmia, uh, is much more likely to occur in women than men. So you do want to find a healthcare team that understands the differences between males and females and doesn't just apply the vast data that we have in men to women, because women are not little men. And you need to appreciate that at the time of menopause, the risk of heart disease does go up. And if you're having symptomatic hot flashes and night sweats and low estrogen state and you're not being treated, that puts further stress on your heart and your brain. 
and untreated menopausal symptoms can increase uh, uh, body weight from a slower metabolism and worse sleep. Cholesterol levels may get worse. Blood pressure may get worse. Not all women flash. Some women just get more fatigued or just have more brain fog or just note metabolically they go kind of to pot. I do want to discuss several gender differences in heart disease um, that you should be on the lookout for. As I mentioned, diabetes is a much stronger risk for heart disease in women than men. And if you've had gestational diabetes during your pregnancy, you are at much higher risk for type 2 diabetes and obstructive sleep apnea. Now, thankfully, we have lots of exciting therapies for diabetes type 2 and also weight and type 1 uh, insulin pumps, um, even pancreatic transplants. So we've made so many advances on treating diabetes and kind of getting to the root of the problem, as well as uh, treatments from nasal CPAP and mouth guards, weight loss, even an Inspire device to treat obstructive sleep apnea. If you're choking off at night and not getting oxygen to your brain and snoring, is a potential symptom of obstruction of the airway and your physician should be looking in your mouth to see what the back of your throat looks like your tongue your teeth and your neck and your airway as well as ask a series of questions that we call stop bang uh, to see if you're at increased risk for sleep apnea and should be referred for a sleep test i tell all my patients who ever have told me that they had gestational diabetes that they have a 90% chance of having sleep apnea. And if they snore at all, they need to see the sleep center specialist. Number two, pregnancy-induced hypertension and preeclampsia and, ecl and eclampsia increases your risk for high blood pressure later in life. So your obstetrical history matters. So it's important to refresh your memory about your obstetrical history when you're going to go see your women's health clinician. And if you've had an abruption, uh, with your placenta, many times that goes along with elevated blood pressure and future hypertension. Number three, don't take any hormonal synthetic estrogenic contraception if you smoke it or over the age of 35. This skyrockets the risk of blood clot and heart attack. And if you have known prothrombin gene mutation, we do not like to use oral hormone therapy because of the increased risk of blood clot. By age 65, it's time to have a discussion about um, how you can actively reduce your risk of stroke and heart attack. Most women do not need a baby aspirin, but if you are at risk uh, or have had known vascular disease, um, that's important to be assessed. But women that don't have any heart disease are not benefited by aspirin use. Number five, statins, which are cholesterol-lowering medicines. As I mentioned, they increase the risk of diabetes more in women than men. And while both sexes with known heart disease or hardening of the arteries, atherosclerosis, can benefit from taking a statin, it generally needs to be done taken at night. That's when your body makes the most cholesterol. We don't really have good convincing evidence for primary prevention in females, but we do in males. And for some of my patients who are on the fence, you can do uh, a Framingham heart uh, risk calculation for your risk of heart disease. That can help. Uh, many of my patients will go and get a coronary artery score. And if their calcium score is zero, and one of my friends just got her result and it was zero, she was so happy. Um, that's great. That means there's not any calcifications or signs of hardening the arteries um, in the heart. But there's other ways to have um, heart attacks, clots, and there's different things that can cause clots, uh, dissections of the uh, blood vessels, and women seem to be a little bit more prone to this. Sometimes it can be genetic. It can run in families. Low copper may uh, promote this. Um, pregnancy may as well. Um, and if you are on a statin, this is the sixth tip, you should have a yearly hemoglobin A1C done. And I find so many women um, aren't getting this simple test ordered. And this tells us what your blood sugar has been over the last three months. And we really like it like under 5.8 or 5.7. Number seven, uh, women in Europe who are prescribed cholesterol-lowering medicines are routinely offered the antioxidant coenzyme Q10. 
uh, for muscle protection because statins can cause myopathy and lower CoQ10. So that's not done as much by American physicians, but it's certainly I talk to my patients about, particularly if they have any musculoskeletal or neurologic symptoms. Number eight, if your hot flashes and menopausal symptoms are well controlled, you need to understand, and so do your prescribers, that stopping hormone therapy, especially under the age of 60, even 65, actually shows an increased risk of stroke and heart attack than those women who just continue on the hormone therapy. So if someone tells you, you've been on hormones for five years, it's time to come off, they're being ageist and sexist, and that's not the right advice. Number nine, we want that hourglass figure. We want our waist as women under 35 inches if possible, and generally men need to aim for 40 inches. Obviously, everybody's individual and body sizes are different, uh, but doing morphometric assessments, total body fat assessments, following the body weight, but it's not just all the weight. You can be skinny fat and a normal body weight and BMI, but just not have very much muscle. Uh, contrary, you can have a high BMI. I'm thinking of all three of my sons. <laughs> and not have obesity at all, but just have really big muscles and bones. Number 10, women on oral hormones, either hormonal contraception or oral hormone therapy, tend to have a higher ultrasensitive CRP level, but this is a liver epiphenomenon. So don't get panicked if your ultrasensitive CRP is elevated and you had it done when you were taking oral hormones, okay? I usually will get this as a baseline before starting hormones. If your hormone levels are borderline as a female, and your ultrasensitive CRP is low, very low. That's reassuring to me that you don't have inflammation. And inflammation in this ultrasensitive CRP seem to have more predictive value than just the absolute LDL. I mean, there are people who have very high cholesterol levels who never have heart disease. It's just one factor. And inflammation, visceral body fat around the heart and the abdomen and the liver, higher blood sugars, uh, insulin resistance, elevated blood pressure, that whole constellation of symptoms is so much more important and concerning than just a single cholesterol level. Number 11, as I mentioned, women disproportionately have more heart rhythm, long QT syndromes for medications. And um, there's some medications uh, such as some antibiotics like in the azithromycin class that can prolong it. Some antihistamines can. Um, hydroxychloroquine, Plaquenil, which is a very safe medication used for lots of autoimmune conditions in women. If it's at a high dose with other medicines mixed can increase it. Probably the most common medicine I see is women on antidepressants, on uh, citalopram, Celexa. I really don't like doses of 40. I see some women on that dose. Um, and I like a baseline EKG. Uh, and if it's it's getting um, at all in the upper limits of normal, I usually recommend that they get their medication regimen shifted around or focus more on diet and exercise and bright light and other uh, mood elevating uh, activities. Number 12, metabolism of medicines such as beta blockers uh, can be different in women than men. And beta blockers can be used um, to help hypertension, uh, migraine headaches, uh, essential tremor, um, sometimes anxiety. Uh, but if there's asthma or any kind of heart block or a very slow pulse, we may not want to use beta blockers. Number 13, palpitations may be a manifestation actually of hot flashes. Uh, However, anyone who is, gets palpitations needs to be evaluated with an EKG and an exam and a blood pressure, assessment of what medicines or drugs or substances or caffeine that someone may be on, may need you know, potentially an exercise stress test. But if the palpitations go away when the menopausal symptoms are treated, then you know that was why you had it. Women in chest pain, what to do? Well, as I started out this podcast, not all women have classic substernal chest pain. Many women, in fact, who have angina pectoris just complain of fatigue. Oh, I can't quite do the same amount of housework or activities. Oh, I'm just more short of breath when I'm exerting myself. 
So if you have acute chest pain, something different, um, exertional problems, you need to see a physician. Uh, if it's urgent, you need to go to the closest emergency room or urgent care department or call 911. If you have chest pain and you think at all you're having a heart attack or stroke, um, you want to call 911. I think it's good to have a baby aspirin or a bottle of regular aspirin around. Um, I certainly have it in my you know, kit in my car and at home because uh, you would want to take an aspirin, assuming there's no allergic reaction or GI bleeding, um, if you think you're having trouble with clots. And as a woman, be assertive. Even if you don't look like the typical heart attack patient, uh, you want to get a standard emergency evaluation. And one thing I would say is that uh, several years ago, the FDA put out a warning about biotin or B7. And I see so many women on high dose biotin because they think it helps their hair. I think last year's uh, podcast on hair was my most listened to podcast. Um, But biotin doesn't really help the hair that much, probably more the nails. And it interferes with lots of cardiac tests um, that are done in the emergency room to look for heart failure or heart attack. Uh, and so you really need to know what you're on just because something's over the counter doesn't mean it's not significant or that your healthcare team doesn't need to know about it. Um, having an anti-inflammatory diet that's heart healthy, which generally is the Mediterranean type of diet, you know, trying to avoid all fat. I mean, there are good fats that are good for your heart and your brain. Um, and for most people, Uh, Lean cuts of meat are perfectly healthy and very nutritional, but trans fats and processed foods and seed oils and sugar and lots of simple carbohydrates, really, those should be taken out of your diet. Now, if you have not been an exerciser and you're trying to get into exercising, you really don't know about your exercise tolerance or cardiac status, uh, then it's probably good to visit your physician who you know may or may not do an exercise tolerance test on you or a baseline EKG or listen to your heart and check your pulses. Uh, there's lots of non-invasive ways to assess carotid ultrasounds and aortic ultrasounds. If you have a family history of an aortic aneurysm, especially males under 60 who smoke, but even females can have aortic aneurysms. Uh, if there's any sudden cardiac death or cardiac arrhythmias, or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, it's important to see a heart specialist and maybe perhaps get an EKG echocardiogram and a um, maybe even genetic cardiac test. So why are love handles bad for your heart? Uh, this was a column that I posted last February. Ugh. So belly fat's bad for your heart. Any kind of fat around the middle, which is visceral fat, which lies inside the abdominal wall that surrounds all your organs. It's, this firm fat is different than the fat that gives you the curves around your butt and legs. Visceral fat is much more dangerous. Uh, so being an apple-shaped body as opposed to a pear shape is worse because that type of fat is metabolically active and it directly affects your body chemistry. Whereas the fat padding on the thighs and behind is warehoused until our body needs to burn it for energy. And um, a few times when I've slipped and fallen on my behind and I don't feel anything, it makes me think I have a little bit too much padding back there. But it's better to have it there than in the front. Belly fat's also been tied to mood. And recent studies link belly fat to depression, actually. So three ways that visceral fat can affect your heart is it wraps around your liver, it interferes with insulin production, it can promote type 2 diabetes, which is such a strong risk factor for heart disease. It lowers your heart-healthy HDL cholesterol and it raises that so-called lethal, lousy, low-density LDL uh, cholesterol. And it can encourage the accumulation of that sticky plaque on the walls of your heart arteries that if they rupture and you get a clot, that's an acute heart attack. And the reason why the Women's Health Initiative saw a slightly higher risk of heart disease, particularly in women over 70, is because most of those women had existing heart disease. And if they hadn't been on estrogen for over 10 years, you acetylate your estrogen Uh, ER alpha and beta receptors. And estrogen is known to affect MMP, which is important in the uterus for control of menstruation. 
and it's associated with plaque rupture. So we don't want to give oral hormones to someone with an unstable cardiovascular system. However, uh, just because you have heart disease, particularly if you've already been on hormone therapy, if you're on hormone therapy and have a heart attack, you have less arrhythmias and better outcomes than a woman who's not on hormone therapy and has a heart attack. And once a woman's heart is stabilized and the blood pressure stabilized, the plaques are stabilized, appropriate blood thinners are used, uh, cardiac interventions as needed are done, uh, statins are on board, uh, then it is fine to use transdermal hormones. And I see lots of younger women who've had cardiac problems, some even with heart transplants, some with heart attacks and strokes, um, some with dissections of the arteries um, that might have occurred during pregnancy. Uh, some women that have just very bad family histories of heart disease. And just because you are burdened with you know, a disease that's serious doesn't mean we can't evaluate and treat your menopause. I mean, you don't need to have a double whammy. So this belly fat pumps out hormones and proteins that promotes inflammation, which is a major contributor to a lot of health problems, diabetes and joint pain and depression and, you know, aches and pains. When hidden plaque does become inflamed, it can burst. And then the platelets, which uh, are the blood clotting molecules, they get drawn to that site to form a plug. But if it blocks all that blood flow to something that's important to an area of your heart or brain, it can have devastating responses. And atrial fibrillation is more common in women, especially hypertension, hypertensive women. And if you have paroxysmal AFib or AFib for you know, over a few days, you can have a little clot the size of the tip of a ballpoint pen. And if that flips off from your heart up up the carotids to your brain can be a, a major stroke. So AFib, the rate has to be controlled. It's good to try to get you back in regular heart rhythm, which the cardiologist many times uh, can do. Sometimes they can ablate these re-entry uh, rhythm problems. And interestingly, the fat around the heart, uh, there was a study published a few years ago that showed that oral conjugated estrogen, Premarin, that's been around for over 70 years, comes in lots of different doses, it was used in the Women's Health Initiative. In women with hysterectomies, it's associated with a reduced risk of breast cancer, even in the 70s. It was shown to be associated with less fat around the heart than just transdermal bioidentical hormones. So there's so much that we're still learning and studying. But we do know that your body shape can put you at risk for heart problems. And... Being female and having estrogen does tend to make more of a pear shape, whereas men tend to collect it around the belly, the apple shape, or the so-called beer gut. Um, but genetically, it depends. You can still be a woman who gets that apple shape. So to find out what kind of shape you're in, you, anyone can calculate their waist to hip ratio with measurements. Uh, you want to measure the waist at the narrowest part and then the hips where they're the widest and compare. If you're a man and your hip, your waist to hip ratio is more than one, that's not good. If you're a female and your ratio is above 0 0.8, that's a problem and an increased risk for heart problems. And we do have that waist to hip calculator on our website, speakingofwomenshealth.com, that can walk you through that calculation. And if you don't have speakingofwomenshealth.com bookmarked on your um, smartphone or your computer or iPad, you should do it. Anytime you have a question, you can just go in the search button. Um, and if you don't have the uh, answer to your question, uh, let us know and we'll work on getting that content out to, to everyone. Now, exercise can prevent visceral fat. And the good news is that exercise can work wonders in trimming the girth of your body, improving your metabolic parameters, improving your mood, and um, you want to promote more brown fat, and, and that we develop more when we're exposed to cold. I know it's a little bit of a fad, these cold immersions or going in a, starting your day with a cold shower, if you can, if you could tolerate that. Um, taking a brisk walk just 30 minutes a day, five days a week, will help stop that growth of visceral fat. Um, jogging or light, uh, or doing other aerobic activity, after you have your physician's blessing, of course, you will see your clothes feel looser and your waistline get trimmer. Visceral fat is usually the first to go when you start aerobic exercise. Now, a lot of women want, 
you know, thinner thighs and a thinner butt, but it's the visceral fat we focus on. And if you don't have an apple shape yet, then you need to start or continue to exercise and enrich your diet with um, plenty of fiber and good foods with good pre and prebiotics and, and probiotics and heart healthy fats. So remember, this is not medical advice. This is just some great um, health information to empower you to be strong and be healthy and be in charge. And we really appreciate you joining me in the sunflower house. I should have some hearts, red hearts all around me because this is a great time to think about your heart this month, but, but all year round. And thanks again for joining us. And don't miss any future episodes. You can subscribe for free to our podcast. Just hit the follow or subscribe button on any app that you listen to podcast. A lot of my patients tell me that uh, they listen to a podcast. I'll say, oh, well, did you hear this one? This is just about what you're here to see me about. And they'll say, no, I, I didn't get that. So if you just get the monthly email, which is certainly fine to have and to get that's only a very small sampling of everything that's on the on the digital platform on the website so um, I think it's best to subscribe to the podcast not that you have to listen to every episode but if you don't want to miss a future episode uh, you can subscribe on lots of places Apple Podcasts, Spotify, TuneIn, wherever you listen to podcasts And if you've enjoyed this podcast and you want to help support us, share it with others. It's very easy to do that electronically. You can also donate to our nonprofit, speakingofwomenshealth.com. Please leave us a five-star rating and a review. That helps us move up in the ratings. So thanks again, and I will look forward to seeing you next time in the Sunflower House.